bit of a mercy mission today. See, out there right now is a dude not unlike you, only he's having a serious problem with his nuts. Like, his wheel nuts. Jesus. It's hardly a medical emergency, but I think that's a personal best right there. See, just 12 seconds in, and already I've managed to take the Lord's name in vain. Now, about those nuts. I'm John Logan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that. <laughs> yes, there. Oh, just click the card that's up there now, dude. That is, if you can reach all the way up there with your mouse, like such an effort. When I acquire a new vehicle, one of the things I like to do is run through the process of changing a tyre as if I had a flat. I feel this is a good check rather than finding something missing when I am away from home. Craig Lavender there. Lavo. Proved, dude. Good plan. Might as well know up front if those nuts of yours have been, I don't know, forge welded on by Satan's ugger dugger. The place to discover this is obviously in the comfort of your own driveway, as opposed to out there, some godforsaken roadside hellhole on the way to Dingo Piss Creek in the sleet on dusk outside of mobile range with the banjos getting closer every second. Okay. Pretty obvious what happens next. We've all seen the movie. I can't remember when I've been able to undo the wheel nuts the first time with the supplied wheel brace. I've usually had to employ some form of additional leverage to loosen the nuts. I'm an 80 kilo bloke of average build, so how many people would have no chance if stuck on the side of the road? Yeah, I agree. This is a thing. See, there is a torque specification for wheel nuts, and it's in the manual, and it matters, dude. In the case of the mighty auto expert Triton GSR, that torque is 118 to 137 newton meters. That's with the alloy wheels, and it's a little bit higher for the steel rims. And with the pissy little standard wheel brace, which has only a moment arm of about 250 millimetres, that's a quarter of a metre, roughly 10 inches in Elizabeth Regina's preferred units. So taking the average of that 118 to 137 newton metres, that's about 50 kilos of force on the end of the standard wrench, which is about 110 pounds for Her Royal Highness, which is kind of a lot of load for ordinary people to generate, uh, you know, down there. It would be beyond the capacity of many people to do that, and certainly beyond the capacity of many people to do that in a controlled and safe way. Plus, of course, when you're undoing a threaded fastener, you have to overcome the static friction to get the fastener moving. So even if you did it up correctly, it's going to require more torque than that to undo. Most people don't consider that. Like, static friction is higher than kinetic friction. It's like I don't know, sliding a fridge over the carpet or something. It's always harder to get the fridge going than to keep it moving. And things have been this way since Jesus himself was converting loaves into fishes or, you know, whatever he actually did. That's two, I think. Where are we now? Just a few minutes in. So I'm about 85 to 90 kilos, depending on recent burger ingestion frenzy. So... If I do a pull-up, for example, that's about 40 kilos of effort per arm, which is a bit less than half of your body weight, right? Because you're obviously not lifting your forearms, are you? And pull-ups are generally regarded as hard. But you need to apply more load than a pull-up to the standard wrench to undo the wheel nut, and you need to do it times five or six, actually, to get the wheel off. 
If you can deadlift 90 kilos, which is hardly extraordinary in the domain of athleticism, but most people probably can't lift their own weight off the deck. That's 45 kilos of tension per arm, which is still less than you need to apply to the standard wrench to undo the nut. These undertakings also pose a significant grip strength challenge. So basically, that means that undoing the wheel nuts with the standard wrench that comes with the car, that's going to be kind of hard for some people and flat out impossible for others. So if this is a process, I think it's safe to say we'd best tweak it. In this confronting situation, the first thing that most people reach for is a piece of pipe to increase the leverage. But I'd suggest that this is actually rather a dud idea. If a fastener is stuck, like properly stuck, slow, steady pulls of this piece of pipe on the wrench nature are the most likely way to break the fastener. And then you're going to have a busted off stud, which is not the end of the world. And it's certainly fixable and not that pricey to repair either. But it's still a dead set pain in the ass. There are better ways to spend one's time, right? It might seem counterintuitive in this stuck fastener situation. But here, impact is definitely your best friend. Impact on a tight fastener is kind of like that trick where the dude whips out the tablecloth from under a fully set table without disturbing the cutlery. I friggin hate it when the cutlery gets disturbed. If you want to step up your wheel removal game and you've got a compressor, then just go out and buy a pneumatic rattle gun like the entry level model, El Cheapo, Best Chinesium, it's going to be fine for the amount that you are going to use it at home, right? I guess a compressor is a fairly expensive thing and it might be hard to get the other half across the line on a capital purchase of that nature with the rising cost of living, whatever. If that is the case, I mean, compressors are fun though. I mean, anyway, if a compressor is a barrier to entry here, then let us all rejoice that we're alive in 2022 because... All of the home handyman brands can sell you one of these for under a hundred bucks. It's essentially just an 18 volt equivalent to the air powered rattle gun. And you just buy the one that you're already in bed with the battery ecosystem of. Doesn't really matter. Azito, Ryobi, they're all going to be good enough at this. This one actually comes with an impact extension as well, which is kind of nice to have. But you'll need to go out and find yourself an impact socket in the right size. And the common size for wheel studs, for the nuts on wheel studs anyway, is 17, 19, 21, 22, and 24, right? Whatever yours is, just go and get one of those. Often they come in a set. They're not that expensive, okay? Here's a regulation socket, and you can see there's a bit more meat on the impact one on this side, and there are a bigger radii in the vertexes here of the hexagon as well. That's just to reduce the stress of being hit. But I suspect for home use, a regular socket will probably prove fairly durable. It's probably just if you're in a workshop doing it day in and day out that one of these is going to just give up the ghost prematurely. So I suspect you probably don't need one of those, but not a bad idea to have it just for completeness. All right. So there is your setup and obviously switch for in and out. Basically, just set it to out and unwind like a pro without raising a sweat. It's beautiful. Really doesn't get much easier than that, does it? So if you pick yourself up one of these babies, I'd suggest that you don't lock yourself into the mindset that it's only to undo the wheel nuts. Because any time you're out there in the world dealing with any kind of medium to heavy duty fastener, like anything bigger than about M10, that does not want to come undone because it's covered in paint or rust or whatever, or it's just really, really tight for some unknown reason, then this baby is your best friend, principally because it'll do a whole bunch of really percussive hits, like hundreds of them, in the time that you could only manage five or six doing it the old-fashioned way. 
For putting the nuts back on though, the pro tip here is to separate the extension and the socket and use this like a screwdriver and get at least the first two threads engaged before you snug up the nuts with the machine. If you don't, if you try and do the whole thing in one hit like this, then you will eventually cross thread and ruin one of those studs. And all of the time that you saved by doing this in one hit is out the window because you'll have to replace that one stud. So definitely get them going by hand first, okay? I don't know how I'd feel about just having that in the car to make it easy though, because you're likely to forget, the battery's likely to go flat, something's likely to press on the trigger, you know? and the battery could just deplete itself gradually in the background. You're not gonna know Murphy's Law. You're gonna get out there and go, <laughs> and go, nothing, okay? And then this is just like roadside furniture, isn't it? So what can you do to step up the game of the standard wrench, which is pretty pathetic? Well, the easiest way just to step this up is to get a hammer and hit this with a hammer. Like, and what we're talking about here in terms of hammer selection and the type of blow, because there's a lot of nuance with using a hammer that ordinary people don't appreciate, right? What we're talking about here is not a deleted scene from Vikings where you're finally beating the brains out of the opposition, right? We're talking about a nice, short, sharp, percussive blow. That's what we really need to just break all of that resistance, a little bit of corrosion, whatever. That's the kind of blow you need. That's the Goldilocks hit. And I really like my brass hammer. It's about 24 ounces, which is pound and a half in the old money or 680 grams in the new money, okay? So that sort of weight tends to be pretty good. The brass hammer doesn't really knock the chrome off your tools that much. So that's kind of nice. If you don't have a brass hammer, you could get yourself a 24 ounce uh, dead blow hammer with a soft face like that. They're pretty good at this. And, uh, you know, they've got a nice big striking surface too, and they're kind of not slippery when you hit. So if you're not confident doing that, then this might be a good sort of learning hammer for that. I did spend a lot of time, you know, hitting various tools with uh, this kind of hammer, like this is just your regulation ball peen hammer. It's 24 ounces as well. Uh, feel free to choke up on it a little bit. You haven't got to use it like this the whole time. You can choke up on it like that and just give it that short, sharp, percussive jab, you know? The pro tip with hammers is you gotta be wary of glancing blow follow through because you don't wanna hit yourself in the knee or the nuts, okay? That's bad, especially the nuts. Although the knee would be a close second, I think you'd agree. Uh, I guess that's just, except if you're paying, you know, a stern German woman to do that kind of thing for you. In which case, as I understand it, although I can't really empathize, it's supposed to be quite therapeutic. So at the risk of going all 2001 A Space Odyssey, or perhaps bad remake of Thor, a tool like this 900 gram, two pound, 32 ounce hammer, whichever language you speak, it's just like a weapon in the sense that it multiplies force. And that means it allows you to do relatively easily what you might otherwise have to devote two to 300 friggin' hernias to, dude. So what we've got here is standard wrench on the nut. We're gonna lift a little bit and give it a bit of preload in the direction of undoing, which would be counterclockwise as you look at it with all right-handed threads. And then we're just gonna give it a few decisive, firm, but not over the top love taps with our force multiplier. Then we're gonna strive not to hit ourselves in ourselves anywhere with any of these blows. So let's see how we go. Now, I don't know about you, but that takes a lot of the gut-busting potential out of this whole exercise. Time six, then you can jack the car up and pull the wheel off, dude. If you wanna step up on wrenches, then one of these sliding T-handle jiggers with a conventional 100 millimeter extension and a socket, perfect. 
Okay, this will get you the clearance away from the dish in the wheel and you can position it so that you can hit the bar in the right spot to give you that percussive release. It's kind of the same length as the standard jigger, but the geometry is a bit better because you're not dealing with this dodgy angle that they saved a few bucks on by, you know, reducing the length of this so to give you the clearance, but it's worse to hit and use, right? So that's much better. It's made of better quality materials. It's also more versatile. And finally, the other thing that is really cheap that gets you out of the woods and, and might actually get someone else out of the woods as well is one of these babies. These give you a hell of a lot more leverage than the standard wrench. They've got four of the five standard sizes, 17, 19, 21 and 22, so you could help some other poor bastard who's managed to get himself stranded without a wheel brace for whatever reason. And these are dead easy to use with a hammer too because you can come back far enough, you can preload the tool like a big screwdriver to eliminate any slack, and then you can give it a decent percussive hit over here. So that's quite versatile as well. These are dirt cheap. I got this one at uh, Auto One, my local flagship Auto One store. They were really helpful and 22 bucks. Like it's got me stuffed how they could make this for 22 bucks. It really does because they've got to jump up these or weld them on. I think they're jumped up and then uh, probably rotary broached or something. And obviously they do it in a factory and mass production, but 22 bucks? Like, I find that amazing, but I'm all for it. So anyway, that's a pretty cheap solution that will get you out of the woods. And also for retightening at the roadside, you've got roughly double the leverage. You've got heaps more clearance away from the wheel for starters, so you can get both hands on it. And you've got, it's like having one of these with two handles, essentially. So you've got double the leverage, double the torque, right? So much easier to get closer to the required torque without needing to work out regularly just so you can get there. Anyway, I hope that's given you a bunch of uh, food for thought when it comes to just tooling up to do this more regularly because I actually think just relying on this for doing regular home maintenance is absolutely for the birds. This is really just there for emergencies and if you're relying on it to do actual work at home then I think that's a bit second rate. I'll put some links in the description regarding some suggestions for the tools and some of the supplies you might want to procure to do this right. Do tire companies over tighten the wheel nuts? Lavo there again. And to that I'd say, yeah, they do sometimes. Like tire fitters, some workshops, some dealerships. It's endemic out there, the reliance on the ugga dugger when the torque wrench would be better. Like. In reality, a wheel on a car is a precision high tensile bolted joint assembly and that means the tension in the bolts really matters. These are generally the only high tensile bolted joints that non-engineering civilians ever interact with. It's just not the same thing as those bolts that hold the tube handles onto your lawnmower or something, or the bolts that hold a timber post into a galvanized stirrup. It's just not, okay? These kinds of peasants bolts, okay? The stirrup, the lawnmower handles, all of that other stuff, right? Typically carry the load in shear. Whereas the high tensile kind of joint is all about the clamping force. So the torque really matters and you can't fudge it. The torque stretches the bolt and the stretch generates clamping force, which generates friction in this case between the boss on the wheel and the flange on the hub. And that's what transmits the drive and the braking loads between the vehicle and the road. So pretty important stuff. The tension in the studs has to be Goldilocks, otherwise the wheel might shift and the drive might be transmitted through the shuds, through the shuds and the studs in shear, through the shuds in tear. We don't want that. That's bad. We're not designed for that. Or they might come loose, which is also bad. Obviously. Or if they're over tightened, they might fail catastrophically in service. And <laughs> I think you'd agree. That's kind of bad also. You're supposed to tighten the wheel nuts with a torque wrench. Leaning on them endlessly with a rattle gun, it's absolutely third rate 
and unprofessional, and yet a heap of workshops do exactly this every day because laziness. Pro tip, okay, those coloured torque limiting extension bars for the ugga dugger, they're not an alternative to using an actual torque wrench, like they're just not. As a customer, I'd be a complete hard ass about this kind of thing, and I would demand that any workshop I pay actually uses a torque wrench. I would not do business with a shop that brushed me on this issue or which paid me lip service and then over tightened them anyway. Like, if I got home and those studs were over cranked, that would be a relationship ender for me. And I would ring them and tell them. And yeah, I'd check them when I get home or if you've got the tools yourself and perhaps you're not as much of a bastard as me, then just crack them open a little bit loose and then retalk them to spec at home and you will absolutely know. I really do want to give you that degree in ghetto engineering after which you've always lusted. But dude, if you want that as bad as I want to give it to you, then you are just going to have to open wide and gag on that, at least for the time being, because not optional. This is the roadmap to catastrophic failure of anything made of steel. We want to know where failure is, obviously, so that we can avoid ever traveling there with our designs. If we can't agree on anything else, I think at least we could agree on that. And therefore, the question really is, how far is the minimum safe distance from catastrophic failure in design? Right? And that's what bolted joint design is all about. It's about being conservatively far enough away from failure that the possibility of going there is remote at worst. Okay, So let's break this down. This is stress that is strained. They're both propeller head concepts that we need not detain ourselves with. Just look at it like this. This is like how hard the nut is stretching the stud because that's what the nut does. That's what the thread does. It's a big ramp, isn't it, you know? And its only function is to allow the nut to creep up on it and drag tension into the stud. So this is how hard is the nut pulling on the stud? And this is how far is the stud stretching? And the red line is the relationship between those two things. And I used to work in a testing lab and we used to do this all the time. Big, fat, 100-ton tensile test rig, analog machine with a graph printer that essentially measured the load and how far the sample was stretching. And it would print this out using one of those old, you know, graph-style tractor-feed paper thingos from the age of the dinosaurs, right? So this is actually the behaviour of steel on the road to failure, no doubt. And where we want to be is on this straight line because that's the elastic region. That's like you bend it a bit, it comes back to its original shape. You stretch it a bit, it comes back to its original length. That's that, okay? This thing here, this little notch is called the yield point. And just think about that for a bolt. It's the throwaway point because that's the point where the stretch gets permanent. If you stretch it after that, this bit is permanent, okay? and the fastener is a throwaway, okay? It has to be a throwaway. So in order to design a bolted joint that's durable, where you can undo the threaded fastener and put it back on and reuse it multiple times, you have to be conservatively away from the throwaway point. And they, they have a point, you know, you look up the tables, recommended torque, whatever, that gets you about here on the graph, about halfway to failure, about two-thirds of the way to throwing it away, okay? That's why this is here. It's a Goldilocks-type sweet spot where you've got enough clamping force that the joint doesn't come loose, but you're so far away from throwing the fastener away, okay? Now, there are some fasteners in cars, typically rod bolts and head bolts and things like that, that can be a thing called torque to yield. So they use all of this latent capacity and the bolt ends up stretched right up to this point where it is permanent, okay? The problem with those fasteners is every time you undo them, you've got to throw them away. So not all that good for holding the wheels on cars, seeing as tyres need to be rotated and brakes need servicing and things of that nature, okay? It gets expensive fast. So what they do is 
This is called the ultimate tensile strength. That's how hard the bolt can pull before it fails, right? We don't want to go anywhere near that, but even if you do get to the throwaway point, there is still some latent safety margin keeping that wheel on the car, okay? Don't get there though, because if you do and you keep the load on, failure is a done deal, dude, right? Because it just runs away. So they've got this thing in design called a proof load, which is comfortably underneath the throwaway point. It's like 90% of the throwaway point. And then they base all of their calculations for the stretch of bolts on that. And it's typically 65% of the proof load here, which is where the recommended torque is at. And if you want to put numbers on that, because that always helps, these numbers are in megapascals. Don't worry what that really means. It's, think about it like for a particular bolt, it's just the same as load, okay? This is like a thousand, and this is like about 500. So you're about halfway to the maximum possible load that the bolt can endure, and you're about, I don't know, it's 57% of the weight of the throwaway point. So you've still got 43% of this elastic range to just sit there and be a safety margin without braking, okay? And that sort of matters. That's what the recommended torque is when you look it up in a table for a particular bolt. It gets you into this zone here where you're a long way from throwing the bolt away. And that really helps because a torque wrench is better than using the power of your mind <laughs> to pick the torque, right? But it's still approximate and there are lots of variables, mainly the amount of friction under the head of the bolt and things of that nature, right? So realistically, it could be 30% higher or 30% lower and you're still gonna be okay because this is how conservative the design is. You've got this safety margin, right? And that really matters. Now, with a wheel stud, manufacturers don't typically say in the manual what the stud is, but a lot of wheel studs are approximately the same or their performance is approximately the same as an M12 by 1.75 metric class 10.9 high tensile fastener. And you go, blah, 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 what does that mean? It just basically means this. It's going to break at about nine tons. It's going to be a throwaway at about eight tons. And you're going to torque it up when you use the recommended torque to about four and a half tons. Now, to me, this is just amazing, right? Because even though the shitty little wrench in the vehicle needs 50 kilos of effort like this to get it to whatever it is, 127 newton meters or something, that's going to give you four and a half tons of clamping force. So for 50 kilos of effort with that sort of slippery inclined plane of the thread wrapped into a helix around the shaft, you're converting 50 kilos of human effort into four and a half tons of mechanical clamping force. And if you've got six studs like a 4x4 ute or something, then that's 27 tons of clamping force holding the rim on the flange, right? That's friggin' amazing. If you've got a five stud wheel, it's like 22 and a half. I just wanted to bring that to your attention so that you know what's going on in the background here so that you understand the conservatism here that means these things function so reliably if you just respect them vestigially and also the incredible amount of mechanical effort that you can instill in something with a relatively small amount of human effort. I just, you know call me small-minded, but every time I think about that, you look at all those cars rolling around, the wheels have effectively a big hydraulic press on them with between 20 and 30 tonnes of force, sort of thing, equivalent, holding those wheels onto the vehicle. And hashtag amazing. If workshops don't over-tighten them, then why can't I loosen them with the standard wheel brace? Lavo there again. And the first part of this is, as discussed, static friction for undoing a bolted joint is going to require more effort than doing it up, like every time. So there's that. Undoing it is the hardest part of the job, right? I'm pretty sure the standard wheel brace is actually the minimum required tool to do this job 
And if you think about it from the point of view of the manufacturer, that tool is in that kit because it's just meant to be there for changing a wheel at the side of the road when you get a flat tire. It's not a proper home spec workshop tool. Like it's just not. Think about it like this in the context of how it might be used in the manner the manufacturer envisages. Let's say you have a really bad run and you get one flat tire every year for the 15 years that you own a particular car. That's 15 emergency tire changes at the roadside, 75 wheel nut undos, and 75 roadside redos if you've got five starts, right? I really don't think we need snap-on for that kind of sporadic usage, right? But I'd say if you want to do DIY automotive crap at home, you really do need to upgrade to superior tools, right? So get a decent socket set and some spanners made of drop-forged chrome vanadium kind of thing. They don't have to be top shelf. Brands like King Chrome, Barco, some of the home brands such as Renegade or Gear Wrench like that, they're going to be fine. Your fat cave probably does not need Snap-on or Vera although they are very nice, right? You just need tools that are compatible with a judicious hit with the hammer. Get yourself a brass hammer too, because they are friggin' awesome. Or you could get a copper hammer like this. The obvious difference, right, is that copper is softer than brass. So these deform a lot more over time. I've always wanted one of these Thor hammers, and I just bought one on Amazon the other day. I haven't had a chance to use it yet, but... These things are just right, incidentally, for doing some sort of very kooky jobs. Like, let's say you've got a mulcher that ingests a tent peg, like a steel tent peg, instead of just things that could potentially turn into mulch. I had this happen several years ago, and it bent the crankshaft of the machine. And the crankshaft is cast iron in machines like that, right? And you can't disassemble the engine and put it in a press and straighten it because pressing a cast iron shaft straight is a guaranteed way to break it. So what you do is you leave it in place and you run a dial indicator and you find the high spot, give it a tap with a soft face hammer. And then you test it again with the indicator and you keep going until you've got acceptable run out, like a couple of thou or something, right? And that's counterintuitive, but they're a really good tool for jobs of this nature. So hammers have their place. And I know that there are probably dozens of people out there now gagging to tell me in the comments that using a hammer on a wrench is a ham-fisted, mechanically unsympathetic and generally abusive way to treat one's tools. Hitting them with a hammer, you friggin' butcher, kind of thing. Now, if you're one of them, I would respectfully retort, dude, you just don't know what you're talking about, okay? You've never worked in industry. Every apprentice toolmaker, every fitter machinist, every motor mechanic, etc., gets taught the judicious use of the hammer on the wrench for undoing stubborn fasteners. The hammer beats leverage every time, and it's the least likely way to break any reluctant fastener. Does this imply that the standard wheel brace is generally insufficient to correctly tighten the wheels? The standard wrench is certainly built down to a price. There's absolutely no doubt about that, right? And it is a fairly unergonomic piece of shit, mainly because nobody ever made the decision not to buy a particular new car based on the inherent shitness of the standard emergency toolkit. That never happens, statistically, right? But I suspect it's also a bit pathetic and short to ensure that some steroid-loaded, ham-fisted, testosterone overdosed imbecile simply cannot overcrank the nuts at the roadside and stretch the studs, right? Because that really is dogs and cats living together. You can lean on the standard wrench pretty damn hard without getting anywhere near the throwaway point. I admit that I've never used a torque wrench to do up my nuts. Okay, so admitting the problem is certainly the first step on the road to a solution. And you have to understand that a high tensile bolted joint is a precision assembly. And you really don't have any business going near one of those. In other words, attempting to put one together without using a torque wrench. 
And it doesn't matter how skilled you are or how skilled you think you are, you simply cannot Jedi the shit out of the talk just using the incredible power of your mind. You just can't do that, dude. They've done tests using proficient tradesmen and the torque wrench always wins, okay? A torque wrench is the point where practicality and repeatability of assembly collide. There are certainly more accurate ways to tighten bolts, but they're not that practical in an automotive workshop context, right? It's a bit more aerospace if you want to do that, and it takes time, and it's not that cheap. I'd further suggest that the car maker did not bother putting the torque settings in the manual because it was kind of optional. They really didn't. So there's that. It'd be remiss not to discuss torque wrenches because if you're gonna do this stuff, you know, you're gonna tool up for getting the wheels off the ground and rotating the tires and checking the tension in the wheel nuts, make sure that the dude with the ugga dugger didn't overdo it when you got new tires, whatever. If you're gonna do that, you are gonna need a torque wrench. My only thing at the risk of getting on a high horse about this is that there's a class of DIYer who reveres the torque wrench in his garage in the way that the Knights of the Round Table revered Excalibur. And that's kind of misplaced because there's nothing special about them. You're just going to need one. Get one like this, which is that wind-up handle job with a vernier scale on it. It's got foot pounds and newton meters, two scales, two different settings, pretty cleverly worked out with the one vernier driving both. You know, it just clicks when you get to the torque. There's nothing on this that is particularly vulnerable to damage, doesn't need to be wrapped in cotton wool or, you know, it doesn't need to have the flame of eternity burning underneath it or whatever. It's just another tool, dude, and provided you don't let it roll around in the back of yo ute, under a load of bricks, it's gonna be fine, right? So all you do is you wind it up to the preset setting and you've got to start low and wind up. And if you overshoot it, don't just go back and get exactly on the money, go back a couple of turns and then go up again. And this time don't overshoot because there's backlash, right? And you want to always come up on it as opposed to coming back, right? Same sort of thing as using a lathe or a mill, you know, when you're making those final passes, you want to make sure that if you've had to back the tool away and come across it, when you advance it again, you, would, you back it off far enough so that the advance compensates for the backlash on the screws, right? This is that. So you just want to come up and get there and then lock it off and use it, wait till it goes click. The pro tip with using one is just do it gently and smoothly and consistently until it releases and clicks and then you know you're there. Don't jerk it because that inertial jerk can cause the click to go off prematurely and we don't want that, right? So the other thing about using a torque wrench is the tightening sequence matters and with a five star, a five star wheel it's a star pattern, one, two, three, four, five, like that. If it's a six stud, you do a diagonal, you go back to the first one, you step over. You do that diagonal, you go back to that one, you step over, and then you complete that diagonal. And whenever you're doing this at home, and in particular out there at the roadside, with one of these, with one of these, it doesn't matter, do it twice. And the only reason for the second go around is to make sure that you didn't miss one. And that's likely out there on the roadside because you might have the family gibbering in your ear or whatever. Some kid might be arcing up and you've got to be on the job, okay? So the second go around just ensures a little bit of redundancy and makes sure that you don't take off with one of those studs loose because that's bad, okay? Apart from that, you want a half inch drive. You want it to have about 200 Newton meters of ultimate capacity. They're available in all kinds of sizes. This is my go-to one. It's, I've had it for years, it's rusty. I actually had to clean it up. It's been really humid and wet in the fat cave. So had to clean it up again to do this segment. I got a bigger one. 
it's about 600 long and it goes up to about 345 newton metres. So, you know, if you're ever rebuilding a Kenworth, then that could come in a bit handy, I suppose. They come in three eighths and quarter drive as well. The quarter drive is really good for smaller items, you know, bicycles and things of that nature. Some of those fittings have torque settings as well. The pro tip with the selection of this stuff is if you need to do left-handed threads, you got to make sure that the particular lightsaber that you choose is compatible with torque settings in both senses, clockwise and anti-clockwise, right? They, uh, they aren't all compatible with that. So if you've got any left-handed threads in mind, you need to bear that in mind. The other thing is there's this sort of reverence for always undoing the lock nut and backing the screw right off after you've finished. I don't see that as being salient at all. I don't see it mattering because the only thing you're working against in here is a steel spring and steel springs don't give a crap how long they spend tension. They don't get a set in them like that. That's not how they function. So I don't understand the uh, reverence for decoupling the mechanism after every use. As long as you don't use this like a pry bar or a hammer or store it under bricks, don't treat it like the new baby. It's going to be fine, dude. Once you've got yourself a torque wrench or torque wrenches, like they say it's a sickness, but I'm not seeing it. You're going to find plenty of other uses for it slash them, right? Heaven forbid you might actually start buying high tensile fasteners and using them correctly to do cool stuff in your own fat cave. Can you imagine how therapeutic deeply that can be? But at the roadside, fitting a spare, okay, you can absolutely live briefly without the torque wrench. You can. Use the stock toolkit, give the wrench a hard shove to torque the bolts, get home safe, undo the bolts. You don't even have to jack the car up. Just back them off half a turn or something and then re-torque with the torque wrench properly and you are good to go, okay? Another thing to consider here is if the car's got disc brakes, Doing the wheel nuts up inconsistently or in the wrong order or both, that could easily warp your brake discs. And then they wear unevenly as you brake and that makes them vibrate. This condition is called DTV or disc thickness variation. It's undesirable and kind of expensive to fix because you generally need to replace the brake discs. Now, before I let you go, I've got these two ghetto engineering hacks and another key point for you to consider. Let's say that you go out and you buy yourself a used car, okay? And that means by definition that even if it looks okay, you're really not across the granular detail of how that car has been treated in the service department. In other words, you don't know if one of the studs or more has been taken out behind the back shed one day and just ugger duggered to death, taken beyond the point of no return, the yield point, the throwaway point. So it could be a throwaway and yet it's in service on the vehicle now. Whenever the vehicle's turning and burning, it's rolling like that and that's a liability. And you can't just tell by looking at it, and you certainly can't Jedi mind power this determination, there has to be a better way. So let's think about the threads. And earlier on in this video, I did say that the average wheel stud, you know, most wheel studs are M12 by 1.75, which incidentally is that, although this is a socket head cap screw. But anyway, same thread. And I was talking to a thread brainiac the other day, and he pointed out to me that most studs on cars are actually M12 by 1.5, not 1.75. And I looked that up and he was bang on, okay? So it's a finer pitched thread. And in the metric system, that number after the 12 is the pitch of the thread, meaning the distance between the adjacent peaks on the threads. This is 1.75 millimetres. The one on your car is 1.5 most likely, okay? So it doesn't seem like much, but it's actually a slightly shallower ramp. And as you know, when you've got a shallower ramp, it's easy to push the same load up a less steep hill, right? That's really what we're talking about. Or to look at this another way, the same load 
gives you more effort because the ramp is, or you achieve more with the same load, even though you've ultimately got to push it further to get to the same height kind of thing. This is that. So the same torque on a finer thread equals more tension, but you have to turn the fastener more to get there. So anyway, if we just think about the geometry of the threads, right, and how threads work, and maybe look at a bigger version of the same thing. This is M24 by three in this case. It's exactly the same principle, just easier to see, and I can't tell how well the camera's focusing on the baby one. So if this is 1.5 millimetres, if we go back to imagining that this is M12, 1.5 between the peaks, that means the distance between a peak and a valley is three quarters of a millimetre, okay, which is 30 thou in the old money. So it wouldn't take very much permanent stretch on the bolt to interfere with the functioning of the nut because, you know, I don't know what it would be. It'd be an interesting exercise, I guess, to measure the stretch that would ruin the functionality of the nut, ruin its ability to run up and down the thread. But that's exactly how you test whether the bolt is a throwaway. So if you get an M12 by 1.5 nut, like a freshly minted one, and you run it up and down the studs in your car, and if it just goes and binds, and you can't run it by finger beyond a certain point, then pretty much that stud is a fail, right? It's a throwaway. It's been over tweaked. It's a really good ghetto engineering test for all kinds of fasteners. Like you might pull something apart, something that matters and you might wonder if you can reuse the fasteners so if you get the right nut and you can just run it up and down the thread you're pretty much good to go maybe there's still some other failure mechanisms that this process doesn't account for but generally you're okay if you can run the nut up and down the thread and it's a really easy test to do if the bolt does stretch permanently, it's going to stretch, it's going to fail down in the valley because that's where the cross-sectional area is the least. And it's likely to fail up near where the nut sits when it's in operation, okay? So you get the right nut, you run it up and down the thread, you're good to go. This is also the same as if you go to the um, scrap metal joint one day and you see a whole bunch of high tensile bolts in a bucket and you think, that might be a bargain. Well... I'd be running the nut up and down those bolts before I put them in service anywhere that mattered just to make sure that you weren't buying a bucket of throwaways. Here's another one of those comment imbecile trigger points, okay? Where would we be without them? Should you use anti-seize on wheel studs? Most owners' manuals say emphatically no. And I know why they say this, but I say, yeah, sure, if you do it right. And this is not some arbitrary opinion of mine. It's what the fastener manufacturers themselves have to say about anti-seize. Fastener manufacturers, right, they've got skin in this game because it's their products that keep those bridges overheads and they stop those cranes from nose diving on building sites and in factories and they keep all those rims on all those cars etc. This is important to get right, okay? So this is the Ajax Fastener Handbook. Google can find one for you, download it as a PDF, dead easy. And here's a quote from page 49. Because friction is the major unknown variable affecting the relationship between torque applied and tension induced, the presence of light oil lubrication is the minimum standard recommended for consistency in controlled tightening of fasteners. Okay, so that term, light oil lubrication, it's got a particular meaning. And the quote there is, this is from Ajax, most plain finish fasteners are supplied with a sufficient oil residue from their processing. So when your owner's manual says, don't lubricate the studs, that means don't add more lube, but the fasteners themselves should remain lightly oiled, residually oiled, whatever, okay? It certainly doesn't mean wash everything down with friggin' acetone and assemble them bone dry. This advice from the manufacturer of your vehicle is there in the manual because owner's manuals operate within a framework 
that has to assume the people using the manual potentially know jack shit about the underlying engineering of the vehicle. So the manual kind of has to be written that way. When you understand the context, you know about the nuance and you can make adaptations. So if you add a heap more lubricant and then you tighten the nuts to the spec in the manual, more of the torque you apply is going to go into stretching the stud because less of it is going to be required to overcome friction because lubrication banishes friction to some degree. And in that situation, that's potentially bad because you might end up beyond the throwaway point. Like, Probably not, because there is a large safety margin there, but it is possible for bolts with special surface finishes or assembled with anti-seize compounds or heavily greased, the torque-induced preload relationship is likely to be altered and the recommendations require modification. Allow me to translate. If you use anti-seize, you need less torque to deliver the same stretch in the studs. And that means the key question here is going to be how much less torque, dude? And thankfully, some Ajax brainiac has already made this fairly straightforward after numerous analyses in the real world. On page 50 of the handbook, which I so suggest you get and download, quote, standard finish plus heavy grease, correction factor equals 0.7. Right there. And that means if you want to use anti-seize, get the notionally dry torque setting, meaning lightly oiled, residually oiled, okay, and just multiply it by 0.7. Or here in ghetto engineering PhD class, just knock about a third off, dude. Like manual says 120 newton metres dry, so make that about 80 newton metres if you use anti-seize. I'm not telling you to do this, okay? My official advice remains, do not deviate from what the manual says. I'm telling you what the conventional engineering practice is for the use of anti-seize in high tensile bolted joints of which wheel on your car is one. And I do this with my cars, okay? And I'm happy to deviate from the manual and to wear the consequences mainly because I know there will be none. What you choose to do, however, is entirely up to you, and that's something that you're going to have to be responsible for. I'm just laying it out, okay? If you decide to use anti-seize, there's no need to lather it on. Just a little smear is going to be fine. And as for choosing the right anti-seize, because... There's so many different flavours out there, apparently, so different. Just read the fine print to make sure that it's not contraindicated with aluminium if you've got alloy wheels. Usually there's no contraindications. Pretty simple. I just use a copper-based one, and not because that's especially magical. It's more like I was standing there and it was on the shelf in front of my grill at the exact moment that I needed anti-seize. Go figure. It's okay, it does the job. I use it pretty much on all reassembly of machine tools and yard tools and things of that nature, right? It's really just high temperature grease with a few little flakes of copper and zinc oxide, plus a bit of oil mixed in, I think. It, the oil does tend to separate out if you leave it sitting there. It's good for operation from sub-zero to over a thousand degrees C, so you can absolutely use it on exhaust studs and turbo housings and things of that nature. And it's compatible with marine applications as well if you've got a boat trailer or something like that. CRC does a half-decent anti-seize that's copper-based. You can get it in a 75 mil tube, which is going to be fine, dude, because you don't need that much of it on hand if you're just an average guy with an average fat cave, right? You can also get it in a 400 mil spray pack with one of those little tubes on the nozzle which is great for getting into tight spaces okay or you can buy half a liter of the stuff in a big tin which for the average diy dude it's going to be more than enough to bequeath half of it to one of your grandkids after you croak okay i'd go to ames industrial in sydney for that i'll put links in the description 
if you want to procure it while you're sitting here on your ass just now. Actually, you should check out Ames Industrial because they're a terrific Aussie business and they supply exactly this kind of thing and also a great place to pick up all kinds of high tensile fasteners and other cool engineering stuff generally. Like, it's more fun than going to Bunnings if you happen to be an aspiring ghetto engineer with a fat cave, basically. I'll put links in the description. And finally, the vexed question of are your nuts just going to get loose and fall off if you do any of that? And what is the risk of that? I don't know about you, but I just don't want to be the hero in the movie where the hero's nuts just fall off. And finally, just for completeness, and because I know it's going to come up in the comments if I don't address this, let's talk about the risk of the nut just coming loose, especially if you use anti-seize, okay? And dude, I understand why someone would go down this track, their gut might tell them that the nut might come loose. It's a reasonable thought experiment. I get people thinking that this might be a concern, but in the domain of reality, a stud in good condition with a correctly tightened high tensile nut on it doing its thing they don't come loose. And here's why, okay? Now, I know that the nut spins easily enough on the thread, but when it's in operation, there's a huge amount of clamping force and a huge amount of resistance on the nut, which you experience every time you have to crack one open to get the wheel off. And they supply this wrench, right? And it's about a quarter of a metre out here, and it requires at least 50 kilos of effort to undo the nut, okay? So, as a thought experiment, how much effort is required when you halve the length of the spanner? Let's say we take it to the bandsaw over there, and we just neck it in half. It's going to need 100 kilos here to undo, right? And if we take it back to the bandsaw and go again, it's going to take 200 kilos here, right? Or 400 kilos here. So let's do a little thought experiment where we say to ourselves, well, this M24 is actually M12. What about if we shrink the wrench? And we can't actually do this in physical reality because there's no space for it. But if we shrink the wrench down to the point where the effort is applied at the seating face of the nut, right? It's probably about it's probably about 10 millimeters on an M12 nut assembly, right? A radius of 10. And that would be 25 times shorter than the standard wrench, requiring 25 times more turning effort load force because the radius is so much smaller, okay? So 25 times 50 is like 1.25 tonnes or something. And I'm not seeing any influence in the assembly that can result in 1.25 tonnes worth of undoing load operating on the nut while it's just sitting there. And if you take it all down by a third by using anti-seize, I'm still not seeing 850 kilos of undoing influence on the nut. And don't get me wrong, high tensile bolts, they come loose all the time, but not on cars. They typically come loose where you've got a high tensile joint that also involves a gasket being done up for the first time, like in a pipeline or some pump installation or something of that nature. You need the gasket to keep the pumped fluid in the system, okay? And you need the high tensile bolt to keep it all cranked up. So what they generally do procedurally in those kinds of environments is there's a second retorking operation, right? So you install something with a brand new gasket and then at some time or at some operational time later, like let's say the system runs for six hours or something, then there'll be a process in the installation manual that says fitter comes back in six hours and goes again with the torque wrench, right? And other reasons for things of this nature coming undone include uh, surface finishes settling, like if you've got a relatively 
roughly machined surface and you crank it up the first time, then the peaks, coincident peaks on each surface might deform a little bit and the whole thing might settle, in which case there'll be a process in the manual for the fitter to come back and go again with the torque wrench, right? And the only other influence that I can foresee that would result in the same kind of loosening effect could be or temperature or vibration, okay? So there's not much vibration of wheels. There's really not, because if the wheel was vibrating very much, you'd feel it in the cabin, obviously. So vibration is off the table for wheels and their installation on the hub. And temperature, well, temperature, if you've got steel wheels and a steel stud and a steel nut, then the thermal expansion coefficient for all these materials, as the brakes heat up and transmit their heat into those components, they're all going to be at about the same temperature, so the expansion's all going to be about the same. Ergo, there's no reason for the nut to come loose, okay? And if you've got an alloy wheel, then the coefficient of thermal expansion for aluminium is actually about double that of steel. I think it's about 11 for steel and about 23 or something for aluminium. Anyway, you can look that up and tell me if I'm wrong, but it's about double. So if the alloy wheel heats up, what's going to happen to the stud is it's going to get tighter, not looser. And then when it all cools down, when you're parked overnight or something, it's just going to revert to the tension it was at when you installed the nut the first time. Okay, so... There's really no influence that I can see that would motivate the nut to come loose, irrespective of whether anti-seize is involved in the installation or not.